Hello everyone, my name is Larry Laux. I'm a senior systems engineer here at Vision Core. And today we're going to take a few minutes and find out what is virtualization. There's a lot of hype about this technology in the industry. Pretty much all of the major operating system vendors are virtualizing or supporting virtualization in one way or another. And so let's take a look and find out what virtualization is and what it does to our IT infrastructure. So we have a model that we've used for really a couple of decades in the IT industry where we have some vendor brand hardware down here, insert your favorite, could be Dell, HP, IBM, whatever you run in your shop. And then we have various operating systems that run on top of this hardware. Now, the operating systems are bound to the hardware by drivers. So if I have an HP ProLiant you know, DL360, for example, and I install a copy of Windows uh, 2008 server, uh, if I go into Device Manager, I'll see drivers that are specific to that piece of hardware. So I may see a SCU the SCSI board driver for that particular server or the video driver for that particular server. And then, of course, on top of this, we run various types of applications and services. Now, <clears throat> this is the way that things have been for a long time in the IT industry, and virtualization changes all this. There are a lot of limitations with this traditional model. For example, uh, with this traditional model, we have one operating system uh, per server, and that's it. This operating system monopolizes and controls this piece of hardware. And um, of course, the OS is bound to this, this particular piece of hardware by the drivers. So of course, this makes backups, more importantly, restores, and migrations uh, very challenging. You know? So going back to our example of having a, a DL360, if I have an operating system on there with applications and I want to migrate that to a different server, maybe a different model HP server, I want to move it over to another vendor server so I can shut this one down and modify some hardware, well, as you, as you know, in a non-virtualized space, it's not really that easy. We can't just take operating systems for the most part and move them around uh, to other servers. Even if we image them correctly, uh, the operating system, when it goes to boot, it expects to see the hardware based upon the driver set that it has currently installed. Failing that, it will typically crash or blue screen or something like that. So <clears throat> as we look at disaster recovery and talk about disaster recovery, you know, backups are, are relatively easy, but the restores are the problem, right? I heard it said that you know, backups are optionals, but restores are not. So imagine you have a server that you've been backing up faithfully for three or four years, and you get down the road one day, the server fries. And now you have to take that image that you have. You have your data. You have it all backed up. But you want to restore that somewhere in your environment. Well, again, you can't just take that, for the most part, and restore it to some other server, because that image is looking to have those, that same hardware under there supported by the embedded drivers. Um, <clears throat> Now, because of this, another side effect of this model in the industry is that we end up with lots of underutilized servers. Pretty much every application vendor wants you to have an isolated server for their application. So if I go out and I buy an accounting package, the vendor doesn't want me to take his accounting package and put it on a server with five or six other applications that may cause performance degradation or support problems for the vendor. Right? It's very difficult to support that kind of thing. And so typically your application vendors require that you have an isolated server dedicated to their application or task. And so we end up with all these underutilized servers out here in the industry. Uh, if you look at industry studies, about 5 to 15 percent average uh, processor utilization across the Intel market. And this has become known as server sprawl. Of course, there's a lot of wasted money here, right? If I spent you know, $10,000 on this server and I'm only using 10 percent of it, well, in, in a way of looking at it, I'm kind of wasting $9,000 worth of computing power. Uh, of course, another side effect, an additional cost center of this, is all of the additional support contracts that I have to have for these extra servers, the power consumption for all these extra servers. And as we'll see with virtualization, we're going to be able to radically reduce a lot of these costs and simplify and improve management at the same time. So now let's take a look at the virtualized model. Okay, so now we've virtualized. That was quick, wasn't it? We have a new piece of architecture here, a slight change to the architecture that we had before, but it has huge implications. So we see that we have our Vendor X hardware down here. Again, insert your favorite there, whatever you're using your IT shop. Now we have this new virtualization layer. And there are different hypervisors out there, different ways to virtualize. VMware, of course, by far and away has the lion's share of the market. Uh, and there are others out there. But this virtualization layer actually has the drivers embedded now that control this underlying hardware. Now above this, the virtualization layer then presents to our traditional operating systems, what we used to call servers, right? Your Linux boxes and Windows and other, other operating systems. We now present generic server hardware to these operating systems. So the virtualization layer will present a generic SCSI board, a generic video board to these operating systems. And as long as they see the, the basic requirements they need, they're, they're fine. So we have virtualized drivers now that are the same across all of our virtual machines. In other words, if I'm running a VMware hypervisor here, I'll see uh, 
VMware video drivers in all of these virtual machines, even though they may be different operating systems or different operating system version numbers. Now, having made this change, huge implications. First of all, we no longer are limited to one operating system per server, right? Now we can have uh, Windows VMs, Linux VMs, Novell, all kinds of things running on the same server at the same time, each using a piece of the computing resources that are there. And the nice thing about virtual machines is that with VMware, uh, these virtual machines are encapsulated and isolated. So one virtual machine cannot impact the other virtual machine and they can't monopolize the box either. So even if you have a virtual machine that, let's say, that gets a virus and goes crazy, starts using up all kinds of processor or, or trying to allocate memory to itself, those kind of things, that's fine. It can, you know, ruin its slice of the pie, if you will, but it's not allowed to exceed basic mandates and monopolize the entire server, thus impacting the other virtual machines. Now, the operating system we, we saw before was bound to the hardware, but now these operating systems can't see the underlying hardware. If I'm running an HP server here, the virtual machines become oblivious to that. They just see the generic drivers and the generic hardware there, and so this makes the virtual machines portable. Now I can take a virtual machine, if I'm running on one model HP server, it's very easy to copy that in virtual machine because it's encapsulated into a small discrete set of files and I can very easily move that virtual machine to different model servers in the same vendor or even move it to different vendor servers as long as they're running this same uh, hypervisor here to support the virtual hardware. Now of course it stands to reason that if the virtual machines are now portable, that backups, restores, and migration are drastically simplified. So now given that example again where you've been doing backups of, of now a virtual machine for several years and one day you lose a server, well you don't have to worry about going out and trying to obtain a four-year-old server, how are we going to restore this, the OS is bound to the hardware. All of those complications go away now. Uh, we can simply take that virtual machine and bring it up on any server in the environment that's running this same virtualized layer. And in fact, if you carry that thought out a little further, it would make sense that we could probably have the VMs automatically restart in the event of a failure. And that's exactly what VMware does through something called HA or high availability. If we lose a server, for example, the virtual machines on this box can be instantly restarted on this one as long as we have shared storage. All right, so now another benefit of virtualization, return on investment. We used to have lots of underutilized servers equals wasted money, right? Now what we can do is we can set averages and we can keep adding VMs to servers until we reach some predefined average threshold that we define as acceptable for our IT environment. So we may set a policy, for example, that says we keep adding virtual machines to servers until we get to 60-65% utilization. You want to leave a little buffer space in there for spikes in activity and also for failover in case of uh, that we lose some hardware, right? Uh, but now we can have much higher average utilization levels. No, no longer do we need to have the 5, 10, 15%. You know, servers that are basically doing nothing that we've paid for of course, that means return on investment for the money we spent on the hardware. Now, as part of the virtualization process, one of the things that inherently happens, because we can put multiple operating systems on individual boxes while still keeping them isolated, making the application vendors happy, is that we can begin to consolidate servers. I've, I've seen consolidation ratios, guys, as high as 40 to 1, but you know, a, a real realistic expe expectation for just about any environment will be 7 to 1, 10 to 1. Those would be conservative numbers. So if you can imagine an IT department where you have 100 servers, and you could suddenly minimize that and take it down to 10 servers. And again, that's being fairly conservative. Um, clearly, we're going to have reduced costs, right? Less maintenance contracts for fewer servers. We're going to have less power consumption for the servers that we do have. Less rack space in the environment as well. And overall, virtualization reduces the cost in the environment while improving disaster recovery, improving manageability, and improving portability of the virtual machines. So that's what virtualization is all about. That's why there's so much hype about it in the industry. There's really no downsides here, guys. It's an amazing technology. It's the best thing I've seen in 24 years in the IT industry. All of your major OS vendors are jumping on board with this, and a lot of the application vendors are too, so you do well to ramp up. Check out visioncore.com, and we make some great applications to help you manage this environment. Thanks so much.